All right, so we're talking about inventions and technology in the machine age. This is our tail end of the Industrial Revolution Unit, and we're going to talk about some inventors. Now, the inventors build on the work of inventors before them because the inventors, they're like, I can do that invention better, or they get inspired by someone's invention, and so they make an invention that goes along with that. So inventors are just kind of building, making things better as they go. The goal, of course, is to speed up the production of items so that they have tons of stuff to sell more money to make and of course the price of goods goes down if you can make things faster and in large quantities now the first thing they focus on textiles fabrics clothing they like clothing i like clothing you like clothing john k liked clothing so he invents the flying shuttle to speed up the weaving process and to make fabric faster john k was like you know what we need to make some fabric so that all the other Johns of the world can look good in their suit and tie when they're not wrestling. Then we get James Hargraves. He comes up with the spinning jenny. The spinning jenny is going to spin cotton into thread very quickly. So we've got some thread here. You can see the cotton, which was, of course, being grown in South Carolina because that's what we do here. All right, then we got this guy. Richard Arkwright. Ladies, ladies, sit down. I know he's good looking, but he's dead. So Richard Arkwright invents the water frame. It used water to power the spinning machines. Now you can remember this because an ark is a giant boat and it floats in water. Arkwright water frame arc and water they go together. He was so cool that in London they put a cool sign on his house to be like Arkwright lives here, or did, before he died. Um, James Watt is our next guy. Now, if you look at the playlist, we've got a lovely flow vocabulary rap. James Watt is so cool and so amazing that they included him in the flow vocabulary rap. Why? Because he came up with the steam engine. That makes it so that factories do not have to be near water power or river in order to work. So um, the steam engine boils water, and that steam uh, powers the the engine. Uh, so basically, you could have an underwear factory in your backyard even if you don't have any water. Thank you, James Watt. Next up, Edmund Cartwright. He invented the power loom. It weaves the thread into cloth super duper fast. He saw what John Kay did and he's like, I could do that better. And then our last textile guy that we care about is Eli Whitney. He invented the cotton gin. It cleaned cotton 50 times faster than a human could. And it's kind of this machine that like brushes the cotton and the seeds fall to the bottom. It's cool. All right, so after textiles, let's focus on coal, iron, and steel. Steel like your abs. Just kidding. All right, so the rise of factories increased so the uh, demand for iron and coal increased. Iron makes the machines, coal powers the steam engine. Henry Court invented a process that makes really awesome iron. And with really awesome iron, you can make a whole bunch of different stuff. And you can make iron at large quantities. So you get, you get more production of iron. The prices are going to drop because when there's a greater supply, the price could go down. And then from iron, we get steel. Henry Bessemer and William Kelly figure out how to make iron into steel. Now, we don't really care about William Kelly. I mean, we do, except he went bankrupt. So this whole steel making process is called the Bessemer process. So Henry Bessemer and steel. They start making steel. They start mining iron like crazy. And whole communities uh, form or grow up around these mines. Because people like to live close to work. That brings us to the steel age. Now, the Steel Age, um, if you look here, this guy in the lower corner, his name is Andrew Carnegie. And he is uh, what people think about when they think of Steel Age. He's like the titan of the Steel Age. And um, steel is great because it's flexible, where iron is a little bit more brittle. And so people want to use that in order to make railroads because the railroads aren't going to break down as easily. Skyscrapers, skyscrapers other big buildings, it really makes the city a lot higher. Um, and so Andrew Carnegie is behind a lot of that. And he's also very philanthropic. So he looks like uh, Santa Claus. 
he also kind of acts like Santa Claus. He gave out like tons of money, established libraries. He was the man. Which brings us to steamboats and railroads. How do you get steel all over the world? Steamboats and railroads. So they would use these uh, for transportation of the textiles and anything else that's made in a factory. Which brings us to Robert Fulton. He is the inventor of the steamboat. He's the inventor, and then if you remember from our last video, Matthew Perry is the guy that takes the steamboat into Japan, freaks all the Japanese people out, and makes Japan want to industrialize too. So Robert Fulton's steamboat, Matthew Perry's steamboat. All these factories lead to this vocabulary term, mass production making things in large quantities. Items are identical. They come out really, really fast, which means they're going to be less expensive than something that's handmade. Go to YouTube, watch one of those How It's Made videos. I prefer the hot dog one. Now, if everything is identical, that means the parts in that product are also identical, which means the parts can easily be replaced. So if your car breaks down or your bike breaks down rather than getting a whole new bike you can just get a new part for it we attribute that again to Eli Whitney see Eli Whitney is so awesome with interchangeable parts and the cotton gin that they slap his face on a stamp maybe someday you'll have your face on a stamp and then we've got this guy Henry Ford thank you Henry Ford I love that you invented the car so Henry Ford comes up with a uh, the automobile, that's what most people know him for, but also the assembly line. So he uses like a conveyor belt and workers just stand at their section of the conveyor belt. And the worker might just have like the same thing to do day after day after day, like left tire, left tire, left tire, over and over and over again. It's monotonous, meaning it's the same thing over and over. But it's very efficient. And Henry Ford is able to churn out cars like crazy, making them less expensive and more affordable to people in America. Then SOS, SOS. If you've heard of SOS, then you've probably heard of Samuel Morse or Morse code. He invented the telegraph. It's kind of like early texting. It's communicating through dots and dashes, sort of like now we communicate with smiley faces and frowny faces. So Alexander Graham Bell is our next guy. He invented the telephone and he is so amazing that Reba McIntyre writes a song about him. It goes like this, back in 1876 in a boy named Bell. That's also on the playlist. You can listen to it because she's way better than me. So he's so amazing. Everyone loves him. He invents a telephone. Now, even if you live far away, you can call your granny whenever you want. And then there's this guy, Marconi. He loved Reba McIntyre's song so much that he was like, everyone in the whole world should hear this song. And he invents the radio. And then our last guy, Thomas Edison. There he is, Thomas Edison. Thank you so much for inventing the light bulb. So Thomas Edison invents the light bulb and this sparks the beginning of electric machines. So over the course of our unit first we talked about handmade goods which would be the cottage industry or the domestic system. Then we talked about water power. Then we talked about the steam engine and now we've got electric machines making all our cool stuff. Nikes, whatevs. And that's everything you need to know about the inventors of the industrial revolution. And that's all. Have a good day.